Hello and welcome to Learn Spanish at Oboricua. It's time for class. Today we are reviewing the conversation we had in the previous episode, in episode 13. And uh, we talked about El Choque Cultural para Alfredo in Carolina del Norte. So today we're going to be reviewing some of the vocabs and some from I, I can do English, some fun phrases that came up in uh, the last episode. As always, the way that I recommend you work through this depends on your level. If you're a super beginner, then you should probably start with the class episode and then go back one to the conversation because you will have gotten a lot more of the context filled in for you. You will have learned the vocab. You'll have that gratifying experience of being able to pick up on the words that you've learned from today's class. If you're a little bit more intermediate advanced, listen in the order that you'd like, but don't get lazy right? Take this vocab and write it down. Make sure that it somehow makes it into something that you're reviewing, whether that be actual physical flashcards, whether you're using an app like Anki flashcards or Quizlet, make sure that these make their way into your practice. I always looked at vocab like freedom. I felt so trapped in the language that the idea of having more words and more phrases was like getting to share more of me. I was getting to bust out of this cage that I felt like I was in when speaking in Spanish. So if you're thinking that you can do this in a lazy way, then I have bad news for you. It's not gonna happen. You need to review vocab frequently if you're not in a place where you're speaking Spanish every day or else your brain just won't hold on to it. I can already notice the difference with me starting to learn Italian. I haven't been reviewing Spanish vocab as much and I can tell a couple words that we were out last night that I are on my cards. I haven't reviewed them enough or enough recently for me to confidently use them. I was wondering if I was saying the right thing. You don't really want that to be your experience when you're just trying to be out socially and have a good time is, is constantly uh, second guessing that the words you're using are correct. So um, I simply cannot do it all. That's the reality. If I'm going to add in another language. I knew that Spanish was going to suffer a little bit, but um, trying to, it's good information and it's Something I can use when I think about planning, you know, setting up my schedule for myself this month and the next month. So as the things that I want to do personally and professionally, I can also make space to write in, you know, review Spanish vocab. I know that I need to keep that on there because as Italian gets in there, everything is going to just become worse and worse in all the languages. Alrighty, let's get into it. Is there anything else I wanted to say? Sure is. I highly recommend that you view today's episode on YouTube. You need that visual piece in order for these words to get into your brain. Without further ado, let's get into it. Following up, I have two things that I mentioned in the last episode, in the last class, I'm sorry, the last class episode, um, and needed to clarify and correct on those. So in that episode, it was when we were talking about your personality in Spanish and the El Dobro de that episode. Okay. In the class I talked about, I mentioned that las amistades, the word amistades is used. And I couldn't, I didn't really know what the difference was between saying amistades or amigos. My sense was maybe that amistades was a little bit closer. Completely the opposite, my friends. In Puerto Rico, when you use los amigos, mi amigo, you're referring to close friends, people you've known for a year, people you already have confianza. Eh, con quien tienes confianza, okay? Eh, las amistades are less close, maybe friends from work. They're not, it's not super close. I'm glad that I put that in twice in case you didn't understand what less close meant. It means not super close. <laughs> Haven't shared many personal moments together, you know, you you guys can start to sort this out in your brain. People that you've known for years that have been through personal situations with that, you know, you've maybe had trips with, you've uh, slept in the same place together, you've woken up, you've done things like that. They've seen you in all of your phases and uh, amistades is going to be less so. People that you only maybe encounter in work or et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That was good for me to learn as well. I also need to correct myself. I said that quien lo sabría would translate as who to thunk. How we say who to thank. It actually translates to who would know. Quien lo sabría? Quien lo sabría? Who would know? Truly, who to thank is quien lo hubiera pensado. Quien lo hubiera pensado? Because who to thank, we pronounce it. Don't get mad at Puerto Ricans for dropping letters when y'all know that we say things like who to thank and what you up to. That should be what are you up to. And it's just what you most of the time. Truly, I can't remember the last time I called my sister and been like, what are you up to? 
So we do the same thing. We drop sometimes entire words from sentences. Uh, who to thunk is actually who would have thought, right? And that uh, the would have tense is, is expressed with hubiera. That's would have. So quien hubiera pensado would have thought it. You need that lo there in Spanish. They use it in places where we don't usually in English. Okay. Quien lo sabría who would know. Quien lo hubiera pensado would have thunk it. Need to correct myself on that. Okay. Vocabulario. I wanted to share, you'll see some pictures from our trip from North Carolina in this slideshow. I don't really share, uh, unless you're my close friends on Instagram, I don't share many personal photos there because most of y'all are, are following me to learn Spanish. You don't care about my personal life. But if you're here watching my podcast and I'm spending all this time on you, then you better get to know a little bit about me, damn it. I'm just playing, I'm just playing. Okay, here we are. Here's my sister. There's baby Lincoln. He turned one in April. Here's Anfredo. I'm obviously the one taking the picture. All right, I wanted to review, this is a common error, the difference between mudarse and moverse. Okay, so mudarse is always the one that you have to use when you are referring to moving residents. You don't use mover when you're referring to, I move from one apartment to the other, from one city to another, from one state to Puerto Rico, whatever. That's mudarse always. So it's a reflexive verb. That means that it always needs the me, te, se, nos, or se with it when you conjugate it. Uh, for example, me mudé is I moved, se mudaron, they moved. I use that in the podcast to say that my my sister moved, se mudó, uh, Carolina Norte hace años, y mis padres la siguieron, se mudaron, they followed her, la siguieron, se mudaron para Carolina, they moved. Difference uh, is with, sorry, different than moverse, which is to move oneself, to move one's body, okay? It's reflexive, so again, it always needs a me, say, you're going to see that they here stuck to the end of it on the command. Where is it? I have people that ask, where is it, or how do you know when to place the me or the se or the te, whatever it is, at the beginning or at the end? That depends on the conjugation of the verb and the structure of the sentence. I have all of the examples of where the me say whatever the reflexive pronoun can be placed in the live class that I have on reflexive verbs, which I have mentioned 8,000 times in this freaking podcast. If you sign up for my platform, you have access to the various classes that I've done on reflexive verbs, which includes where to place this little guy, okay? When it's in a command form, it has to be at the end. That's how you form command, right? Muevete, ponte los zapatos es eh, cállate la boca that te at the end always happens in command form it has to be that way okay so you've probably heard maybe you've heard muevete is like move move get yourself moving move one's body and i want to take this as a quick opportunity to just touch on the philosophy of of reflexive verbs if you're if it's moverse and it's reflexive it means that you're moving yourself as in your own body that's why muevete or me gusta moverme i like to move i'm an active person to everything else, I'm aware of me, okay? If it's not reflexive, then the difference is that it's not happening to yourself. So you drop the personal pronoun, the thing, I'm sorry, the reflexive pronoun, the thing that implies that you're doing the action to yourself, like me, mudé, I moved, right? And we're looking at this one more. So me, moví, whatever, I moved myself for a little while. It's, I'm not happen it's not happening to me anymore. And now it's happening to something outside of myself. I give this example all the time with reflexive verbs with the verb lavarse. Lavarse is implying that you're washing something on your own body. Me lavo las manos. Me lavo el pelo. I wash my hands. I wash my hair. It's happening to myself. That's why I have the me there. That's why it's reflexive. What am I washing? Washing myself versus to wash a car. I'm not, the action's not coming back to me. I'm doing the action to something outside of myself. It's not reflexive, therefore. It's only reflexive if I'm doing the action to myself, hence a reflection, a mirror action, versus if I'm doing the action to some object, something or someone outside of myself, it's no longer reflexive. So if I just use mover, and I'm, I'm implying that I'm going to move an object, move something or someone, if I moved a person, moved a cat, whatever. Okay, here's again, we're looking at it in, in command form. Mueve el sofá hacia la izquierda. Mueve el sofá hacia la izquierda. 
move the couch to the left a little bit. I'm you can't make this muévete because then you're <laughs> implying that you want the person to move. I'm asking you to move something. It's no longer reflexive. I hope that makes sense. If not, go check out the class that I have on reflexive verbs. Sign up for my platform. Okay, we talked about, uh, we had a bonfire the night of my birthday, La Fogata, you can use for bonfire. And Malvadico, okay. I was really surprised to hear this word because it sounds very Spanish. And when words are very Spanish like that, very, very from Spain, they tend, and, and if they're a little bit more complicated or whatever, they sound a little silly, then Puerto Ricans will a lot of times use the word in English, okay? I was surprised that Alfredo used Malvadisco, but he used it again. We were out last night with his best friend, his best friend's girlfriend. I went to a Mexican restaurant and he again used Malvadiscos. And we even laughed about it because I was like, it sounds like a un disco malo, malvado, like an evil disc. Uh, I was going back and forth on the WhatsApp group, which by the way, I should mention, I put up a video on my Instagram last week, inspired by another, uh, something I had seen to create a group that connects Puerto Ricans from the island that are trying to practice their English with my gringos that are specifically trying to practice their Puerto Rican Spanish or they wanna practice with Puerto Ricans. So I created a WhatsApp group, we've been chatting. I'm not really modifying the group today. I did ask a lot of questions as I was clarifying for uh, para la cosa sobre el podcast, um, but it's really for you guys to practice. So like today I put out there, you know, send an audio, uh, to the group in the chat about what you're going to do this week it's to practice speaking. I also want people to use the group as a way to find language partners. If you're at that point where you know, like, I could do a little audio talking about what I have going on during the week, it wouldn't be too hard. But where I get tripped up is whole conversations, is being able to think on the spot and come up with things. The only way to get better at that is by specifically practicing that. You need to practice conversation. You need to practice being on the spot, being unprepared for a question that someone's going to ask you and being able to respond to it. That is ultimately fluency, right? Not, not thinking about what you're going to say, prepping an audio and then sending it. It's really being able to be agile with the language in the moment. So use that group also to find language partners. I hope that people are, are doing that. Um, so if you're interested, send me a message on, you can send me a message on Instagram is what I would prefer so that I can keep track of it. Um, cause I don't always get notifications that I see about comments on YouTube. You're welcome to comment on YouTube. But like I said, I'd just be a little bit more secure if you send me a message via Instagram that you'd like to be part of the group and I will send you the link for you to join that WhatsApp group. Um, okay, so today, back to Malvadiscos. Today, I was writing down Malvadiscos for this presentation. And when I went to look up, because it's not a word that I've ever used before, I want to confirm that it's spelled correctly, et cetera. I went to look it up and it was, what popped up was Malvadiscos with a V, not a D, not discos, discos. And then I asked my Puerto Ricans, they said, neither. We say marshmallow which is what I had thought. I had definitely know my friend, Kelly, if you're watching this, I'm like, I've definitely heard my friends say marshmallow. So I'm surprised that Alfredo is using malvadiscos, but it seems like if you're going to use one or the other in Puerto Rico, it's definitely going to be malvadiscos, not malvadiscos con V, not with a B, it's going to be with a D, but know that people are often going to say marshmallow more often. I don't know why this anormal, this weirdo is saying malvadiscos and being very fancy. And the word makes me laugh. So know that you're going to hear Malvadiscos. Alfredo might bring it up at another time in his life because he loves s'mores. Uh, but know that you can also get away with marshmallow. Here we are in paddleboarding on my birthday. My sister's literally breastfeeding while paddling. I mean, moms are amazing. Okay. Uh, and there's my cuñado and there's Alfredo there in the middle. And that's me on my board at the end. Okay, desde que tenía 12 años, ya más o menos domin dominaba el idioma. Desde que tenía 12 años, ya más o menos dominaba el idioma. Let's talk about the verb dominar. This is a quote from Alfredo from last episode. Dominar, as you might expect, means to dominate or to master. Or to be fluent in a language, the verb dominar means to be fluent in a language. People all the time want to say something like quiero ser fluido or fluente or something like that. Where's my, 
I'm sorry, my X showed up way too late. I didn't get that right in the animations. That's supposed to be a red X over there, okay? Quiero ser fluido does not work. That is your English brain trying to speak, uh, trying to translate directly into Spanish. No, you can use quiero hablar con fluidez, con más fluidez. So I want to speak with more fluent. I want to speak with more fluency. I want to speak more fluently. You could translate that as quiero hablar con más fluidez. That's a very natural thing to say. I've heard native speakers talk about that when speaking about English. Que ellos quieren hablar con más fluidez en inglés. So that's perfectly fine. But know that when you say something like domino en español, or if somebody says to you, I had that experience too, it's very gratifying that people will say, tú sí dominas el español. Means you really are fluent in Spanish. Domino en español, I'm fluent in Spanish, okay? So uh, stop trying to directly translate to be fluent. It doesn't happen. You can speak with more fluency or you can use the verb dominar. Okay, but you can't use that one that I X'd out. Which I'm not going to repeat so you don't have it in your brain. You're going to hear Alfredo say, and a lot of Puerto Ricans use, lamentablemente. You might have learned that, unfortunately, is desafortunadamente, but it's more work for your mouth. And native speakers have this way of finding the easiest and most concise way to say whatever the hell it is they're trying to say and going with that. That's going to be the option they choose. We're not going to make our life more difficult and try to make things wordier or whatever, unless you're my sister. Um, but I, I think it's truly a, an ease of, of thing that you, desafortunadamente does exist. It's not like you can't ever say it or people won't know what you mean, what you mean when you say it. They certainly will, but lamentablemente is used quite often here in Puerto Rico to say, unfortunately, and you might find that you have a much easier time producing, producing, pronouncing lamentablemente que desafortunadamente. All right. So know that you have that as an option. <clears throat> Here we are all together. Okay, some phrases, what we're gonna go over now. Eh, tomamos la decisión is what Alfredo said in algún momento. And I just wanted to go over that because that is another one that we, uh, as native English speakers, try to directly translate from Spanish, We to, from English, sorry. We make decisions in English. In Spanish, you take a decision. It's tomar. Una decisión, okay? Tomar una decisión. Please write that down. In Spanish, I did a video about this from something that I read about different languages and how they express things, and I thought it was like, quite lovely. In Spanish, you take decisions. This is also the case for French and Italian. You take decisions like a train that leads you somewhere. In English, you make decisions like they're part of something that you're creating. In German, you meet decisions like an old friend that you're keeping in touch with, something along those lines. I forget what the German, how beautifully they worded that. But quite a lovely way to think about it. This is what I talked about in the end of the episode too, of how um, experiencing different cultures and different languages helps change the way you look at things. So know that in Spanish, you take a decision, something that's going to lead you somewhere. The start of leading you somewhere. You take the decision to learn Spanish, to really commit to doing this, and you have no idea where it might bring you. Uh, your final destination, okay? This is one that's used uh, quite commonly here. A really nice way to say that somebody, basically to express that they welcome you into their home. Um, me abren, he said, cada vez más me abren las puertas de su casa, referring to my, fami my familia. <laughs> you got it, brain. My family, uh, welcoming, bringing him in more to the fold of the family, more, you know, more and more. Hence the cada vez más to start that phrase, cada vez más, me abran las puertas de su casa, is implying that it's like continually happening and turning into this, this thing. So this was something that I used when I, the first year that I was here, the apartment that I rented, which, you know, I, my good friends uh, went by and checked out the apartment, talked to the landlords, but I coordinated everything from Maryland and, and signed the contract and did everything just like speaking to them via FaceTime or whatever. Um, so I felt really grateful that they took a big chance on somebody that was a complete stranger coming from, you know, far away. And I, I got them a little something for Christmas, or maybe it was at the end of the year, at the end of the contract that I lived in that apartment. And I was asking a friend to help me express, you know, the, how the gratitude I felt for them 
welcoming me, a complete stranger, into their home, in, into that little apartment. And this was what she suggested that I wrote. Gracias por abrir, abrirme las puertas de su casa. Gracias por abrirme las puertas de su casa. I'm using su right now because I'm referring to both of them. If it was just one person, it would be tu casa because we'd be in form at this point. Su, it's because it's y'all's house, ustedes. Um, thank you for opening up, literally. Thank you for opening the doors of your house to me. They're opening the doors to their house to me is what Alfredo is saying. That's what it's literally translated. But again, it's the feeling of welcoming, bringing somebody in. Oh, Alfredo used this is another one that I ended up chatting the group with, uh, the group chat, asking a couple of my uh, Puerto Ricanos uh, here on the island to help me out with a couple of weather because I was pretty dang sure it meant full blast or blasting usually used with music but I wanted to confirm before I put that here in the podcast. And that is the case. Alfredo was talking about the difference of the the reality of our cell, of our environment and the noises and how kind of quiet and serene it was where we were specifically in North Carolina and uh, versus what we experience here and some of El Bosate, which I'm going to show you in just a second. He said, uh, Tiene la música a to, a to fuerte, a to fuerte, a to fuerte. And I'm going to do also, friends, I'm going to, a couple uh, native speakers popped in and helped us with the pronunciation of Atofuete. So let's listen. Atofuete. Atofuete. Te lo voy a escribir. Atofuete. En una frase completa, tenían la música Atofuete. No. Okay, tenía la música todo fuerte. That's what um, Fredo, I think that's the exact line he used it. They had the music full blast, they had it blasting, blah, blah, blah. A todo fuerte. I know specifically the use of it in the context of music. I have thought about this with something we use on blast a lot in English, maybe more than you would expect, because I've come across this quite a lot when I've been here. Wanting to refer to the freaking air conditioning sometimes in these places. If y'all come into Puerto Rico ever and then... In doctor's offices, in hospitals, they have the air conditioning set at 47 degrees, I am sure. I don't know why, but I would love to say the air conditioning on blast. And I'm not sure. That might be something I follow up with in our next class. Si se puede usar a todo fuerte in other contexts beyond music. I would like to know for my own self. <clears throat> el boceteo, el boceteo. When you hear boceteo in Puerto Rico, they are referring to these cars that have been modified and made into a walking speaker, a driving speaker. Okay, they've got like how many bocinas? A bocina, B O C I N A, like bocina kitchen, but with B. Bocina is how you say speaker. So they have bocinas. Eh, compraron un montón de bocinas y lo, las montaron ahí en la parte de atrás del carro de la jipeta de, de la guagua. Okay, this is el boceteo. It is a whole thing here. And in the past year or two, a few municipalities that have voted to make fines for people. They're kind of like outlawing boceteo from certain municipalities, um, maybe even within certain hours. I'm not sure. But if you want to look, this picture that I took is from Primera Hora. Uh, the article is called Que es el boceteo? Ni es un artículo. I said article, but it's not. It's a video. So feel free to check this out. Look up Primera Hora en boceteo. And this is going to come up. You could watch this. It would be good listening practice for you. And you'd get the perspective of those who believe that it's a sport and an art. Okay. For most people, it's just a freaking annoyance. All right. The other thing that I talked about that I just wanted to give a visual on was El Sargasso. Uh, I mentioned that and how, uh, for example, that I had read about something in the Dominican Republic that they're doing to help mitigate the, the arrival of, of Sargasso, the, El Alga, El Alga de Algae. Here, this is what Sargasso is. It's this kind of orangish, brownish algae that when it rots, it, it comes up on shore, it rots, it has a horrible smell. It smells like sulfur, like rotting eggs. Um, and it's a problem. It affects tourism. You know, you don't want to be on a beach where there's a bunch of sargasso. So it's really stinky and, and yucky. And not a great feeling when you're in the water swimming either to be swimming in a carpet. Okay, so that's sargasso. So you have that. Okay, we got a couple more phrases. Here's my mom with my sobrina, my niece, Lena, who she'll be turning three in July. 
Ok, <laughs> bastante friendly. I just want you all to know that friendly se usa bastante en Puerto Rico. You can definitely use friendly. You will hear it used a lot. Friendly. Eh, estamos muy atrasados en ciertas cosas, is what Alfredo said. I wanted you to know this because I found, I feel like personally I had a hard time figuring out how to say something that we say very often, which is like, I'm behind. I'm behind on my work, I'm behind, or I need to catch up to imply that you can use eh, estar atrasado. Obviamente, if you're a guy, you would use eh, atrasado. Uh, ladies, we'd use atrasada. Um, and then if it's plural, referring to plural people, then you need the S to be behind. Figuratively, you're not going to use this. Eh, estoy atrás. You use atrás if you're actually behind something or detrás de. Um, this is figuratively to be behind on a deadline and work, etc. Estar atrasado. Write it down. You seeing it once in a PowerPoint is not going to mean that it gets into the folds of your brain. You have to review it. <laughs> this next one just made me laugh, y'all. Si tú no te aguantas, ¿quién te va a aguantar? Si tú no te aguantas, ¿quién te va a aguantar? Basically, if you can't stand yourself, who's going to? That's the best translation. Aguantar, to put up with something. Yeah, you can think of that as soportar as well, but uh, this is... It's reflexive. That's why we have the te there. Si tú no te aguantas, ¿quién te va a aguantar? That's you standing, being able to stand yourself. Hence why it's reflexive. You are standing your own self. It's not reflexive when someone else is doing it to you. They can't stand you. That's not reflexive anymore. They can't stand themselves is reflexive. They can't stand you is not reflexive. Making sense? Hope so. De que me estaba perdiendo. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that Alfredo used this line uh, because perderse versus perder is something that I want to bring up. And also, Jesus, I'm like so sick of talking about reflexive verbs at this point. Sometimes a verb being reflexive, not sometimes, most of the time, a verb being reflexive or not is going to change what it means. Perder, you might know as the verb to lose, that's correct. When it's reflexive, it means to miss or to miss out on something. Perderse is reflexive, it means to miss. So here we've got the me, which it helps us imply that it was reflexive. De que me estaba perdiendo? What was I missing out on? Okay, because it's reflexive. De que estaba perdiendo? It's like what I was losing. Without the me, it really changes what you're saying, okay? Me perdí ese episodio. Isn't that I lost the episode? It's I missed the episode. The me makes all the difference. I talked about work-life balance, which this is one where I feel like another time is Puerto Ricans, a lot of times if they are familiar with the phrase in English, they're going to use in this instant the, the word, the phrase in English, because look at what the effing translation is. Equilibrio entre el trabajo y la vida personal. Or you can say work-life balance. Four syllables or seven words. Six, eight words. Four syllables or eight words to express it in Spanish. This is why Puerto Rico being a colony that's had English exposed to it now for over a hundred years, will sometimes choose the English option because it's always, not always, there's like the three exceptions where, where Spanish is more concise than English, but most of the time English is way more concise. Okay? All right, friends. That'll do it for today. Please, uh, sígueme en las redes sociales, Instagram, in YouTube, and TikTok as Carrie B. There's my username, uh, especially if you'd like to be part of the WhatsApp group where we're practicing and doing some language exchange. I wanted to give you also a quick update on the... You got it, Carrie. Uh, on the transcripts, guys. So take a look at this. This is the website that I'm using to help us transcribe our podcast right now. But I just want to give you a feel for why the hell it takes so long. So they've done really pretty well now that it's a, you know an artificial intel intelligence helping us here. It definitely helps. But it's just like you sending a voice to text message in your native language where you're like, I trust my freaking pronunciation, but it's not always going to get things right. Um, I just wanted to show you this part here. I have I have my sound. 
Your share to listen. Y es un mural, dice Reconstruction, pero el Rican se escribe como Puerto Rican. Y el mural se veía bien impresionante, mm -hmm. pero estaba tapado. Okay. Okay. Tapado. You don't hear that? Let's just go back. I'm gonna go. Al second. final de una calle donde hay una pared con varios murales. Y uno de los murales fue por un, un muralista después de Huracán María. Y es un mural, dice Reconstruction, pero el Rican se escribe como Puerto Rican. Y el mural se veía. Sí. See what I'm saying here? Okay, so it's like it does well. It does decently well. Um, Vikin Shahikin, Sahika, Sahakian is not Puerto Rican reconstruction, but the Rican was written like Rican. I don't know where they got Virgin from, but it's a lot of correcting. So we have to do this for every episode. Um, and that's why it's going to be a bit of a process. And that's why we're also charging for the transcripts because I have to pay somebody to help me get these done. So uh, hoping that in the month of June is when I'm going to la launch that Patreon page for you guys to be able to download the transcripts of the episodes. Just so you know, it's a bit of an undertaking. All right, y'all, let me know any thoughts you have in the comments and I'll be seeing you next time.